Hey everyone. So, um, quick disclaimer first. Uh, what I'll be talking about today are just my thoughts, opinions, and they do not represent my employer or anyone else. So, yeah, good on that. Okay. So, uh, my name is Wojtek. I'm a senior product designer at Brainly. Um, and all you need to know for this presentation is that Brainly is an app uh, and a platform for learning help with millions of users worldwide. If you want to learn more about the product, I conveniently left some of my work, which explains it on the slide right now. And when I worked on them, I think that came in hand was a good familiarity with business and marketing, communication and such, but also just pure visual design. And in that case, a big source of inspiration for me is art. And I love art, as you can tell from my ecstatic expression, this photo taken six years ago, but I don't practice it as much as I used to. So yeah, um, but one affinity from those days still remains. I still like to visit museums. Um, it was in one such place quite recently, the Design Museum of Barcelona, and it was a great time. Um, just three floors uh, full of produ tangible product design history, uh, and with some display pieces you could actually interact with. But from this entire visit, the thing that stuck in my mind the most was not even inside the museum, it was this wall right in front of it. Uh, let's zoom in. It had this message which encouraged people in rather crass but direct language not to spray paint uh, the wall. And yeah, it was funny, it was odd, unexpected, and like, is it actually signed by the local government? Well, I, I didn't know that, but one other question that I had on my mind is, would this actually work in deterring people from spray painting? Well, when I exited, the wall now looked like this, and let's just say that those two gentlemen weren't really faced by the message. But now the absurdity of the situation stood out to me even more. Um, and you know, if we compare it to the official entrance, it's not really as exciting, right? Um, so let's take a look at the exit, which looks like this. Uh, not very exciting either. So if I were to chart my journey with memorability in mind, it would probably look something like this where it started with the graffiti message uh, and supposedly made by the government and ended with it being covered up. And now everything just in between that kind of turned into a blur. Um, and again, I recommend going to the museum. I spent several hours there, but the fact is that the most memorable thing was just this unexpected, unscripted situation. None of the things that were inside the museum really took advantage of that peak end rule. People, myself included, have a tendency to judge experiences not based on objective fact, but on two moments. The peak, the most uh, memorable standout moment, and the culmination of the experience, the end. And it might seem random, but you know, uh, digital experiences often suffer from the same problem where getting through apps is often just getting through a barrage of notifications and promos and marketing, and all of that just also kind of turns into a blur. Now, you know, um, if you were to take, uh, take your phone, up, phone out right now and look at the phone library, you'd probably see about 25% of your apps not, you don't even remember downloading or don't even use anymore. And it's actually so prevalent that phones these days include a feature to offload unused app right from the get-go. So if you haven't turned this on, this is probably the most important learning of the day. But we also need to learn about this as designers as well. Um, because, you know, your product and your solutions might be a well thought out work of art for you, but for the user it just might be a blur. Here's a quick exercise you can do at home or even right now if you're a fast typer, is to take an app you use quite frequently, um, something that you actually trust and you use, uh, you know, and then think about around four or six features that the app advertises or that you're familiar with. Now, 
try to think about the moments that app became indispensable for you when you truly realized you will start using it uh, frequently, you truly realized you would trust it. If you were to underline features connected to that moment, you would probably end up with like one or two, uh, not a very long list. That's because we tend to judge experiences not an objective fact, but on, uh, on habits, calls, routines, emotions. So, for example, if you want to see what your friends are up to, you will go to Facebook. Uh, if you have a need homework help, you'll go to Brainly. If you have a burning question, you will Google it. Google a brand name that's so prevalent in our collective habits, it's literally a verb now. You want to make someone angry, you can tweet something them. Or if you want to use a cut video in your presentation, you can go to TikTok. In other words, products which come to mind in response to a problem first succeed in the market. You might have an incredible understanding of all the individual aspects that make up your product, like the brilliant design or amazing features, the cool technology. But at the end of the day, that perception is going to be greatly simplified in users' view. Uh, they will only care about the larger whole and how the app can actually benefit them. So, in other words, you know, a list of features is nice, but it's not enough for the wow factor. Um, in other words, don't, uh, as the saying goes, don't miss the forest for the trees. Uh, we are getting a bit ahead. Uh, Okay, sorry for that, spoiler. Um, right, um, so basically, um, if you want to actually make people use your product, you should make sure that the value proposition is clear and easy to understand from the get-go, and it's easy to understand as a whole. Uh, here's an example of how you might uh, apply this thinking in practice. This is the old landing page of Brainly. Uh, looks like this. It did just did pretty much everything I just told you not to do, which is just list features in a very mundane and engaging way. The visuals, although cool, don't really connect, like, communicate anything relevant to the message. And overall, when you visit the page, there's no clear thing that you just want to take out and you know that would stick in your mind. It was completely redesigned very recently so that the messaging is clearer, simpler, straight to the point. Uh, it, it focuses on the benefit, expert answers, AI. And the visuals right now communicate something relevant. They show the user how the product actually feels and works like, instead of just explaining it with bullet points. Now, I want to go back to my little story about the museum visit. It highlighted the importance of strong first and last impressions, but also of the peak end rule, and by extension of the peak moments. Points in time with a particularly strong emotional connections, things that are just important events in life, like college graduations, weddings, my presentation, or birthdays. You know, um, and we, as the peak end rule goes, as I stated before, we tend to overvalue the peak moment. It's the most important part of the, you, customer journey that you just tend to think about uh, when you are a particular, uh, just a regular user of a product. So, you know, when creating a customer journey, you might be tempted to just create a billion sticky notes, um, just post it on every possible surface, like in those believable stock photos. But ironically, it might be more beneficial to do less work sometimes, and don't say that to your manager or client. You know, uh, you might, instead of focusing on everything, just want to focus on those particular powerful milestones. So, you know, you might even pour your heart out into all of those sticky notes, uh, create an amazing plan, but you just never know when someone is going to come up and tell you to change all of that into a Unicode character, or, which happened quite recently to another app. But yeah, um, we talked about art. And I want to talk about another passion of mine, which is running. Um, and I wanted to use a picture of myself on this slide, but I couldn't find it. So instead, I just have to use this picture of a guy with a pineapple on his head that I actually run behind uh, during a half marathon. Uh, yeah, running is a great activity for physical and, believe it or not, also mental health. 
uh, and you know, it can tell you a lot about how we approach certain problems since we've literally, uh, how we approach certain problems because we've literally evolved to run. Um, for example, here's a graph of a number of showcasing numbers of marathon finishing times. And the eagle eyed among us might have spotted a particular tendency in this data. Um, if you have you spotted those peaks, uh, um, okay, okay, yeah. No, that's, yeah. So <laughs> those ones are the 30 minute milestones. And just think about it. After a crawling 40 kilometer run, marathoners still muster the energy to just push through that final stretch and race against the ticking clock. We tend to exert that final burst of effort because of that allure of hitting that powerful milestone, that powerful moment of performance, even though those times are really arbitrary. And I even notice a similar tendency in my own runs, even though they are a much shorter distance. Let's go deeper. Uh, back to 1954. It's a year of many amazing moments. Um, the foundation of CERN, the mass polio vaccinations, the first successful organ transplant, and also the breaking of the four-minute barrier by Roger Bannister. So for the longest time, uh, it was believed that people cannot run a mile in under four minutes. That's, it's something that's been tried and failed at for hundreds of years which is debatable. And Roger Bannister set out to close that debate. The day he decided to do it was not perfect. It was cold and windy. Uh, but still, uh, he and two pace setters ran as fast as they could as they had to break that limit. The final lap, Roger Bannister unleashes a powerful last sprint. He pushes himself to his limits, and he succeeded. He completed a mile in three minutes and 59 seconds, which this record would stand for another 46 days. This inhuman achievement of incredible performance, uh, breaking the human limits, stood for just 46 days before John Landy uh, broke it again uh, in just six weeks. Then a year has passed and three other guys did it in a single race. Nearly 70 years have passed since then, and around 1,400 people have done it, which begs the question, has anything changed? Well, we don't really know. Um, motivational speakers will often use this story uh, to talk about how it's all about your mindset, and they will also conveniently exaggerate it and mix the numbers, while skeptics will talk about how this is just a natural progression of the sport, and the mythical barrier is just over blown. But still, um, Bannister breaking the barrier ushered in a rejuvenation of the sport. It was a symbolic moment and one of the few which actually has a name. Now, uh, everyone remembers Bannister, but few know of the other people who performed a similar feat or even a more impressive one. So, yeah, um, you know, we are talking about this beautiful story, but let's be honest, um, you won't be making Olympic history by moving rectangles around in Figma, but you can help others achieve their own moments of Olympic level pride and elevations as a designer. And I have an example here, which won't be my work or even work from Brainly, but it's a really cool example, not getting paid to say this or anything. Um, Nike Run Club and Fitbit are both apps which uh, measure your physical performance. They both give you a little reward, uh, a little badge every time you achieve something. And this happens frequently enough. You actually want to push yourself extra hard, but rarely enough you do get a little dopamine boost every time it happens. In Nike, uh, it might help you uh, push for that year-long running streak or uh, motivate you to beat your own farthest run record. You know, will you be making Olympic history? Well, no, but you can help others create their own stories with many amazing personal moments. And just, you know, you are framing a little bit of insight in a fun way and you are actually making people proud of their own performance. Fitbit has some fun rewards in particular, for example, this one for crossing 2,983 miles. 
it seems oddly specific, and it is. It's the distance you would need to cross to walk uh, across the Sahara Desert. With this, you just don't have some arbitrary random number. You actually have a reference, a physical reference, which is meaningful, which you can understand the magnitude of. It's something surprising on purpose. Uh, it breaks the script. It's um, uh, something that happens in uh, very predictable, rigid uh, circumstances that's unpredictable and surprising. On the other hand, sticking to the script can be good for your business. Just think of McDonald's. Anytime and anywhere you go, you can expect a roughly similar experience, which is a great source of comfort. But, uh, you know, and to the point where you, one of those McDonald's definitely stood out to you. But it's, you know, a double-edged sword, as familiarity, exceptionality are often at odds. Uh, for example, as tempting as it might be to host your wedding at McDonald's, you will probably not do it, or you probably won't expect the President of the United States to serve you Big Macs on a silver platter. Well, digital experience has a good analog of this in the snarkily so-called um, corporate Memphis art style. Uh, it was once a modern uh, uh, alternative to stock photos, and I get its merits. It's reusable, it's adjustable, it's clean, simple, pretty, inclusive, but it's also so ubiquitous. It's just often used to depict things that are just bafflingly inappropriate, um, and we have to wait for the slide to load. Maybe it will happen. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So just bafflingly inappropriate. Or it's even just outright hated by some communities on the internet. And this isn't an endorsement of this, but just a showcase of what the court of public opinion might think if you rely on tropes and just only established patterns. It just can be tedious, boring, uh, expected, disliked, and ultimately bad for business. I want to show another example of breaking a script. Um, and you, uh, first, I need to explain a feature of Brainly. So at Brainly, you can ask a question to a community of millions of students and experts and expect to have it answered within a few minutes. It's a great uh, feature which allows us to craft many exciting moments. Uh, for example, uh, if you answer questions frequently, you might get a little badge for that. And it's similar to the example from before. So uh, every time you... you break some sort of milestone, you get a little batch. It's uh, a moment of pride and elevation. It helps drive engagement and content creation. Just a little, little neat example of how those small little moments can contribute to business goals. But it's also largely a solitary moment. You don't really feel a particular connection to that other person on the other side of the screen, which is why we have the thanks button. Um, this is just a nice little show of appreciation to the person who helped you with your problem. But it doesn't really stand out. It can be that blurry part of user experience. Uh, so this was completely, you know, this was tackled by one of our teams quite recently. Um, and they delivered a feature called personalized thanks, which is pretty simple in execution and concept. So you click the thanks button, but now, a menu appears with custom-made stickers, uh, and they feature fun wordplay and puns and jokes, and, like seal of approval or perfect answer. And now you can express your gratitude in a fun way. Um, it works in several ways. Um, it helps drive, engage, drive engagement. It is uh, something that makes the brand appear as more fun to a younger audience. And it also is a moment of connection. So you don't just click on a button. You actually can express yourself in a way that's fun and memorable. It's something funny, which is great for retention. And it actually makes you feel that there is another person on, this, on the other side of the screen. It humanizes a simple thanks button. And lastly, it's just much more encouraging than what you might get at school for your efforts, like a squiggly letter or a number. It's pretty boring. Well, I'm not going to change the education system, but uh, I can share some books with you. Uh, OK, sorry. Let's go back. 
Oh no. Okay, yeah. Uh, right, so two books, The Power of Moments, a good deep dive into this topic specifically. Uh, the author's name, a few more real life examples of The Power of Moments, and they also provide a bit more data to back the thesis up. Hooked is a good uh, study on how certain products weave habits into the UX. Uh, and they go into a little bit more detail into how certain successful products build a devoted user base. And I would recommend both even to non-designers. It's just those are just good reads. But for now, that will be it. Uh, thanks for listening and joining. Um, you know, I hope that the presentation was uh, inspiring to, in, will inspire you to think about product design from a bit more human point of view, and that it highlighted how then those small little moments can be made to feel as significant as breaking mythical records, or at least more memorable, and that it also showed you why you shouldn't spray paint walls in Barcelona. But for now, that will be it. Uh, thank you for listening, and take care.